Right now on To The Point, a new court ruling could help expand homeowners insurance coverage options. We break down who's eligible and what's needed for it to take effect. Tonight, California Forever's listening tour continues as residents hear from the man behind a new proposed city in Solano County. We'll tell you what's at stake. They're accused of sparking the destructive Caldor fire, but is there enough evidence for them to stand trial? What happened in court today? And as we celebrate Native American history, we take you to Shasta County to highlight the Ajumawi tribe. The importance of the water to the Ajumawi people because it's life. Without water, there's no life. But first, breaking news tonight in Sacramento. One person is dead after being hit by a train. A spokesperson for Union Pacific says one of their trains hit a person near Roseville Road around 4.30 this afternoon. None of the train crew were hurt in the collision. We are working to learn more and we'll keep you updated. We're also following another breaking story tonight. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger has died at 100 years old. Kissinger helped shape foreign affairs under Presidents Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, earning both criticism and a Nobel Peace Prize. He was also the first person ever to serve as both Secretary of State and National Security Advisor. As always, thank you so much for joining us. This is To The Point, and I'm Alex Bell. Now, we have been reporting on the ongoing insurance crisis for years now, and today we learned that the state is one step closer to change something called the insurer of last resort. That's the fair plan. And as Becca Habegger shows us, it could offer people more protection as early as next year. Over the past few years, Californians have seen homeowners insurance policies skyrocket in price or become entirely unavailable where they live, like Patty Cherry, who owns a home in Tuolumne County. Our insurance has been canceled twice on us. I think we all feel angry because you don't know what to do and you don't know where to turn. This comes as most of the major companies in California's homeowners insurance market have paused or restricted new business. They cite the rising risk of wildfires due to climate change, the increasing cost of materials to build a house, and the need for updated state regulations. Having an uninsurable state is not an option. One thing California Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara has been trying to do since 2019 is expand what is covered under the state mandated Fair Access to Insurance Requirements or FAIR plan. This insurance safety net known as the insurer of last resort is increasingly becoming many homeowners only resort. Earlier this fall, the California Fair Plan Association told ABC 10 the plan had reached more than 330,000 policies statewide with about 1,000 applications per weekday and it's usually expensive. It's probably tripled, maybe quadrupled from what we were paying. The fair plan is bare bones, offering just fire insurance. Four years ago, Commissioner Lara ordered the fair plan to offer additional coverage, similar to a comprehensive homeowner's policy, including theft, liability, water damage, snow damage, and more. In response, the fair plan association filed a lawsuit asking a judge to block the orders, saying it would force the fair plan to offer more than what it's legally required to cover. The issue has gone back and forth in the courts for the past four years. This week, a judge issued a decision in favor of the state, saying the insurance commissioner does have the authority to order the fair plan to expand what it covers. A spokesperson for the Department of Insurance says if the fair plan association does not appeal the decision, those changes could come sometime next year. Becca Hobecker joins us now. Becca, my first question, is the Fair Plan Association, are they going to appeal this week's court decision? Do we know that? Yeah, well, a, a Fair Plan spokesperson told me that they're carefully reviewing the court's ruling and its potential impact on policyholders and potential impact on the insurance marketplace right now, which as we know is fraught. They add the Fair Plan exists to provide insurance property owners who are unable to obtain coverage in the voluntary or surplus lines markets. By statute, the Fair Plan is not intended to compete with or replace traditional insurers. And my second question, if you can spell it out for us, if the insurance commissioner's changes do happen to the fair plan, what does that mean for people on the plan right now? Sure, so as you know, someone currently on the fair plan just gets fire coverage for their home. If they want additional coverage, they have to buy extra insurance. That's something called a difference in conditions policy. But if the fair plan expands its coverage, someone could get fire coverage, plus a lot of those things they're currently having to purchase separately Coverage for theft, certain liability, snow damage, like if your roof caves in, water damage, and so forth. 
And I do want to mention before we go, Becca recently did an incredible deep dive into the insurance crisis, including a one-on-one -on -one interview with the insurance commissioner, plus tips for finding affordable homeowners insurance. So we have that link right now on our website at abc10.com slash to the point. Becca, thank you so much. All right, happening now, Flannery Associates planning officials are talking about the proposed city in Solano County, and they're taking questions from the public. ABC 10's Garage Paul Senga is in Vallejo and explains what's being discussed tonight. In the past, we have heard from the CEO of Flannery Associates, but tonight we will hear from the people who are going to be in charge of bringing this city to life. So this meeting is underway here at the Vallejo Naval and Historical Museum, and this is going to be the first time people will hear from the Director of Development Planning, Director of Transportation, and Head of Planning about the project called California Forever. Now, Flannery is composed of a group of Silicon Valley billionaires. It has, over the years, secretly bought up 52,000 acres of agricultural land across Solano County and near Travis Air Force Base. And just this week, a major environmental organization, the Sierra Club, coming out in opposition to the plan because they say it goes against smart growth planning. I was astounded at how much money they were offering me. And um, I didn't, I, I couldn't understand why, to tell you the truth. There are people in Solano County who've directly caused the situation by a bunch of misguided policies that say that old growth is bad and we can only do um, infill, which hasn't worked. And this meeting is still underway here. It is wraps that, up at um, 7 p.m., but this is the first of six meetings planned over the next few weeks. So we're going to have much more on this meeting tonight on Late News Tonight at 11. El Dorado County prosecutors unveiled more evidence today in their case against David and Travis Smith. The father and son duo are accused of starting the Caldor fire, and that fire started in August of 2021, burning the town of Grizzly Flats and then burning all the way to South Lake Tahoe the following month. ABC 10 reporter Brandon Riddiman covered the fire. He's been in the courthouse for us this week and joins us live from Placerville. Brandon, is there going to be a jury trial? Do we know that? Yeah, that's, that is the big question, Alex, and we don't have the answer. It was supposed to be a two-day hearing to decide whether there would be a jury trial, but this is day two, we're done, and unfortunately, we're going to have to come back for more. Travis Shane Smith and his father David watched while prosecutors shared details of the human suffering caused by the Caldor fire. Not only did it destroy hundreds of homes and force more than 50,000 people to evacuate, prosecutors showed evidence of life-altering trauma, both physical and emotional, inflicted on people. District Attorney Investigator Gary Malmquist shared photos of burn wounds from three survivors who went to the UC Davis burn unit. One man in Grizzly Flats told him it was the worst pain of his life and that he, quote, thought he was going to die. Another spent more than a month in the ICU, hoping to regain the use of his hands. The evidence is meant to prove enhancements charged against the Smiths, felony reckless arson with great bodily injury. Meantime, the defense gave us a preview of their case. They argued the DA got the wrong guys and failed to follow up leads on other potential suspects besides the Smiths, including a fire chief in Pioneer, one of the first on scene at the Caldor fire. He's not here to defend himself, He's since died, but the defense got investigators to admit the chief had been an arson suspect in other states and that he was once kicked off a fire in 2018 here in California. That certainly begs that question. Why weren't they looking at someone who was a firefighter that they had information on? Why wasn't that followed up? Was there a bias against following up on that person? The prosecution doesn't have to rebut the defense case right now. They just have to convince the judge that there's probable cause against the Smiths in order to force a trial. If there is one, the standard will then be tougher. The DA would have to prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury. Now, there are gun charges, felony charges against both Smiths as well. A lot of the court session today was spent hearing testimony about those weapons charges, which include possession of a silencer and also attempting to convert a semi-automatic into a machine gun. That's charged against the son only. We just at the very tail end of the court day today got into evidence about the actual origin point, the place where the Caldor fire started out in the forest. And uh, we're expecting to pick right back up with that testimony for day three of this hearing. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until closer to Christmas. It's not going to happen until December 20th. Alex. Brandon, prosecutors have mentioned the possible involvement of incendiary rounds. Did we learn anything more about this today in court? 
Yeah, so incendiary rounds are, are literally their, their ammunition that is designed to start a fire. And it was mentioned in court documents in this case around bail for the Smiths. Um, however, it's our understanding after talking with our sources and listening in on court today, there isn't evidence of incendiary rounds being fired at the origin point of the Caldor fire. However, we did hear testimony that while the search warrants were being served by investigators on the Smiths, that they found incendiary rounds in their possessions. Those rounds are illegal in California. It's not one of the criminal charges in the case, but it's an interesting uh, bit of testimony that we heard in court today. All right, Brandon Ritterman, thank you so much. Still ahead, we take you to the Ajumawi Lava State Springs Park, how the tribe is working to educate people about their ancient fish traps. We're um, keepers of the land from the creator. Ajumawi, are, we are the, the water people, and some people they call it is where the rivers come together. And I'm tracking another weather system just off the coast here, how it's going to impact our weekend forecast. All right, taking you live to downtown Sacramento. It was a rainy start to the day. Chief mm -hmm. Neurologist Monica Woods joins me to explain what we can expect tonight and into tomorrow. And by looking at this, it looks pretty clear out. It looks beautiful. It's so pretty. I, love I it. know. Beautiful fall evening for us. Now, I am tracking another chance for those showers coming in for the weekend forecast. But here you can see across the state, we're back to the clear skies after some early morning rain, giving us about one one hundredth of an inch for Modesto. Better totals across the coast. And this is exactly what we were expecting. We knew that low pressure system was going to kind of hit us with the outer bands on the coast and then slide its way southward. So we got about a quarter of an inch or so for San Francisco and Fairfield. Light the beam forecast. Hey, hopefully that downtown picture has that beam later tonight. 47 degrees. If you're exiting DOCO or if you're heading outside just to snap a picture of it, if that beam goes up 59 degrees is our average high. We've been hovering slightly above that and we'll stay right about that level. Even with the arrival of this next weather system, a few early morning showers along the coast and then on and off rain shower possibilities throughout our Thursday in the valley and some snow showers for the Sierra with our snow line below the passes. If you're headed up to the high country into Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and even early Sunday, expect to see some snow on the passes periodically and the potential for some slow going over the passes. As far as our total rain totals, only about a tenth of an inch to a quarter of an inch for the foothills and about one to six inches of snow possible in the Sierra. We'll take what we can get since each of these weather systems has been fairly weak in uh, delivering rain. Highs in the 30s for the Sierra tomorrow, 40s and 50s down low, 60s across the coast, and we'll see 60s again inland. As I mentioned, there's not a whole lot of fluctuation with our temperatures over the next several days. Next week, we actually start to warm up quite a bit and warm up, uh, or dry out, I should say. Some showers over Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and then a dry and warmer weather pattern ahead. All right, thanks, Monica. All right, on the other side of the break, a behind-the-scenes look of the only state park in California that requires a boat to make the visit. You don't want to miss this story. All right, in 1990, November was designated as the first National American Indian Heritage Month, and all month, ABC 10 is celebrating the Native American community by telling their stories. Tonight, John Bartell takes us to the land of the Ajumawi and the only state park in California that requires a boat ride to visit. Of the more than 280 state parks in California, just one of those parks require a boat to get to. That park is Ajumawi Lava Spring State Park. Many who visit choose to kayak or canoe, starting from a small boat ramp just outside the little town of MacArthur. It's here that a narrow channel surrounded by grass and tule plants eventually leads you to open water. Now, depending on what part of the park you want to visit, uh, you're probably going to have to paddle upwards of two miles. Ajumawi Lava Spring State Park is one of the nation's largest underwater spring systems. The crystal clear water literally boils from the ground and feeds a spider web of lakes, rivers, and creeks, ultimately saturating Shasta County's Fall River Valley. Now, when you finally do reach the park, you're going to want to be respectful because this area was and still is the ancestral home of the Ajumawi people. We're um, keepers of the land from the creator. 
Ajumawi are, we are the, the water people, and some people they call it as where the rivers come together. Virginia Mike is a cultural liaison with the Ajumawi people, which is a band of the Pitt River tribe. Yeah, I mean, look how beautiful it is right there. Yeah. You can, see, uh, you can, I, can you see the fish? Virginia teaches younger tribe members like Antonio Mendoza about the Ajumawi culture and the importance of the water that helps isolate and protect the ancestral lands here. The importance of the water to the Ajumawi people because it's life. Without water, there's no life. As she walks Antonio and I along the lava rock trails, Virginia leads us to a shoreline. Here, you can still see ancient fish traps built by Ajumawi fishermen. They may look like piles of rocks, but those rocks are placed in such a way that trout and sucker fish could be pushed up or herded from deep water to shallow pools. The opening are out, are out there where we herd the fish in. And once we herd them into that pond there, then we close it down and they are herded further in up here into the shallower areas where they're easier to catch. We are not sharing the location of these fish traps to prevent disturbance, but Virginia wants visitors to know what those traps look like so boaters can avoid them. This is what we're trying to protect because people try to drag their boats up into these traps to, to get out. And we're trying to explain to them like, you're destroying you know, our, our fish traps. You know, this has been here for years. There's a long history of non-native people disturbing Ajumawi and Pitt River tribal territory. With the help of the U.S. military, early settlers in the 1860s forced Ajumawi onto reservations so their land could be farmed and logged. We were massacred for our land. You know, they put bounties out on our heads, you know, $100 a head. Why aren't you in here asking PG and Italy? They're the ones that are trespassing on the land, not the Indians. By the early 20th century, much of the remaining Ajumawi land was acquired by Pacific Gas and Electric Company. They built hydroelectric dams, which ultimately blocked salmon from spawning up to Ajumawi water. In an effort to right a wrong, the government agreed to pay reparations to the Ajumawi and Pitt River tribes, who had land taken from them. The money is compensation for land taken from the Indians' ancestors in 1853. Pearl and the other members of the Pitt River tribe intend to refuse the checks. This 1970s documentary shows the conflicts that arose after the tribe learned they would only be paid 47 cents an acre for their land. The pitifully low price was based off the going rate for property back in the 1850s. I couldn't even buy bread at that 47 cents an acre. That's what I say right now. In 1975, California State Parks acquired 6,000 acres of private land and former Ajumawi territory and then turned it into the current day park. It's a bad type of a genocide that happened to our people. I can't change it. The only thing I can do is move forward to make, try to make things better because I have my grandkids that I bring out here. Virginia hopes that one day the ancestral land will be returned to her people. But for now, she uses the park to teach the tribe's culture to younger generations. You know, it's a great honor and great priv privilege to be out here for me, you know, to learn and gain this knowledge, you know, and, and learn about my ancestors and what, what life was all about. If you visit the park, you will find campsites and barbecues, but you'll also see the remnants of a sacred land, once inhabited by the water people, the Ajumawi tribe. It's a traditional place, you know, for my people. It's, it's our culture, mm -hmm. you know. We're not cattle herders, we're fish herders. From Ajumawi Lava Springs State Park, I'm John Bartell. And coming up tomorrow on To The Point, as we continue to highlight Native people, cultures, and traditions, one organization is focusing on empowering Native youth. Native Sister Circle is helping young Native women embrace their identity, build community, and become future leaders through cultural activities and support groups. You can catch that full story tomorrow at 6.30 right here on To The Point. Next, the need for coats is growing. How you can help families stay warm this season.
As the temperatures get cooler, the need for winter coats is growing. A Turlock faith-based organization is asking for your help to make sure that families stay warm. Westside Ministries is collecting new and used coats, winter clothes, and toys as part of their annual Coats for Kids drive. Joy Lynn DeGrazia, the founder of the ministry, started giving blankets to kids nearly 40 years ago as a teacher. One of the young girls later died from brain inflammation, and from that moment on, she wanted to grow the drive. So if you would like to help, you can drop off donations at their building on Columbia Street or Cars Cleaners on East Main Street until December 11th. We have more information on our website, abc10.com. And before I say we want to know what's going on in your community, you can email us. I just want to say we've had some incredibly kind and sweet text messages and emails from you at home. I just wanted to let you know that me and the team, we really do read them. We appreciate them and they have definitely put a smile on our face. So thank you so much and reach out to us anytime. Have a great night. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.